Please join me in the words of our unison affirmation. <laughs> Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. This time. <laughs> this service marks the beginning of what Christians know as Holy Week, which starts with today, Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus rode through the gates of Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. It was a gesture that displayed the power of the powerless. Jesus did not enter the city on a horse as a warrior king might do, but defenseless, weaponless, and knowing, at least according to the story, exactly how this week was going to turn out. The people of Jerusalem were so thrilled to welcome Jesus that they laid before him the coats off their backs and fronds from nearby trees. Now, whether that story actually happened historically or not is beside the point. The point is what it means to us and why it is still the scene that it is depicted on the clock at the rear of our sanctuary. Today is a day when we acknowledge that the genuine prophet is not the one who arrives with wealth and with power, but the one who comes as an outcast, a nonviolent resistor, willingly taking risks on themselves and inviting the retribution of the powers that be. Palm Sunday is a day of radical welcome. Please join me in our responsive reading printed in your order of service. Palm Sunday is found whenever we are serving a noble and unpopular cause with selfless devotion, holding to the ideals of truth and justice, whenever we are seeking to uplift the fallen, to comfort the brokenhearted, to strengthen and encourage the weak and hopeless, whenever we are working bravely and persistently in the face of abuse and criticism to establish more equitable relations in the world, whenever we are sacrificing our lives on behalf of what we believe to be the service of love for all humanity. That is Palm Sunday. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you all for being here on a truly, truly beautiful Sunday at First Parish in Bedford. It's a pleasure to see many of you at pole capping day yesterday and thumb our collective noses at tyrants the world over. We welcome you all this morning just as you are, whatever is going well or not so well in your life right now. Following the service, please join us for community hour in the common room and upstairs in the blend room. Feel free to take your palm fronds with you when you leave or cry hosannas or fan yourself languorously or just leave them behind in your seat. If this is your first time with us here this morning, we invite you to stop by the welcome table if you'd like to find out more about us or tell us more about you. In the back of your order of service is our usual announcement section to highlight several things. Today at 1.30 at the VA is our annual spring program. Hope to see plenty of you there. Please remember as well that we have three, count them, three worship services this coming week. Our Tenebrae service or service of shadows will be held by candlelight on Friday, April 14th at 7 p.m. We have two services on Easter Sunday. First is at 9 a.m. We'll be led by our ministers. The second is a multi-generational service at 11 a.m. which will be led by Lisa Rubin, our Director of Religious Education, and myself. Afterwards, please join us for an Easter egg hunt on the common at noon. Please help create the fun by donating eggs, candy, or cans in advance for the kids to find. All the cans will go to the Bedford Food Pantry after the hunt. In anticipation of Earth Day and the April 29th People's March for Climate Justice and Jobs, we invite you to join us for a 
free screening of Martin Scorsese's acclaimed film Before the Flood. It's April 15th at the Venue Theater in Lexington at 9.45 a.m. is when the doors open. We're particularly excited about this because our own Evan Seitz is the featured after film speaker at this event. We have our membership book up front here. If you would like to become a member of First Parish for the first time, we invite you to come up and sign after the service. Last but certainly not least, I can't fail to mention, even though it's not quite news anymore, last Sunday, the congregation voted to become a physical sanctuary for an immigrant resisting deportation orders welcoming to our sanctuary people who are refusing to obey unjust immigration laws as an act of moral protest is our way of opening the gates of Jerusalem in our time. May we follow the one who enters and who leads us in humility and in risk. As a first step towards living out our solidarity, the First Parish Sanctuary Task Force has launched a crowdfunding campaign through Faithify to enable us to create a livable space for sanctuary. There will be a chance to pledge on site at community hour if you have a chance to stop by the sanctuary table. You'll be getting a free gift with a pledge of any amount of a now vintage Ask Me Anything About Sanctuary shirt. <laughs> Trying to move these things. <laughs> Till we have built Jerusalem, the fight goes on. I would now like to welcome Oliver Nozel to the chancel, be leading us in a stewardship moment. Thank you, Oliver. Okay. Hi, my name is Oliver Nozel, and I'm 14 years old in the eighth grade. I'm here to talk to you about some of the great programs that I've been involved with at First Parish. The OWL, or Our Whole Lives program, has been especially helpful to me because it has provided me with much knowledge that I would, not, that I would get from just taking the school's life skills program. In life skills, they just tell us the information and send us on our way. But in OWL, we think deeply about what we're learning and how it applies to our real lives. One time, when I was in life skills class, I answered one of the questions very thoroughly, and the teacher asked me, do you take the OWL program? <laughs> Junior youth group meets once a week after school, and Lisa and Megan and some First Parish kids meet and talk about how things are going in life and sometimes do community service projects. Usually, we'll talk about a good thing and a bad thing that happened in our week, which, can, uh, which makes it feel like a comfortable and safe environment, which can be a refreshing change from sitting at something like a middle school lunch table every day. Senior choir has been exceptionally useful to me. I sing in the school, play in the school band, and have been in school musicals. Maybe you saw me last night as Ed the Hyena. <laughs> Janet is an incredible teacher who tells you how to improve your singing abilities in a fun and engaging way. She also understands the value of french fries from Ken's in helping to focus a group of rowdy middle and high school kids. If someone is as involved in music as I am and wants a great teacher, or if they just want to sing and have a great time, Senior Choir is the perfect place to go. This winter I got the chance to teach RE. We taught the kids all about skin color, why people have it, and what it means. Uh, teaching was exciting and it made me nostalgic from when I was a younger kid taking RE myself. I've been wanting to get into babysitting and this was a great way to get experience for it. I really like teaching. It's great seeing the kids excited to learn, and I like hearing their thoughts and opinions. I learned that little kids are full of questions and really energetic. <laughs> I remember one class, we were explaining the concept of slavery to the kids. As soon as we finished talking, one of the younger kids blurted out, that makes zero sense. <laughs> so, as you can tell, I am in this church a lot, doing many different things. It always feels like a kind and welcoming place, and I always feel happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Kids and RE leaders will now adjourn to the common room for in-gathering 
we will sing our second hymn, very appropriately titled, O Young and Fearless Prophet, number 276. This is a reading by Robert Fulgham, and it's from the book, You May Know and Love, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Giants, wizards, and dwarves was the game to play. Being left in charge of about 80 children, seven to 10 years old, while their parents were off doing parenty things, I mustered my troops in the church social hall and explained the game. It's a large-scale version of rock, paper, and scissors, and involves some intellectual decision-making. But the real purpose of the game is to make a lot of noise and run around chasing people until nobody knows which side you're on or who won. Organizing a room full of wired-up grade schoolers into two teams, explaining the rudiments of the game, achieving consensus on group identity, all this is no mean accomplishment, but we did it with a right good will, and we were ready to go. The excitement of the chase had reached a critical mass. I yelled out, you have to decide now which you are, a giant, a wizard, or a dwarf. While the groups huddled in frenzied, whispered consultation, a tug came at my pants leg. A small child stands there looking up and asks in a small, concerned voice, where do the mermaids stand? <laughs> where do the mermaids stand? A, a, a pause, a very long pause. 
Where do the mermaids stand? Says I. Yes, you see, I am a mermaid. There are no such things as mermaids. Oh yes, I am one. She did not relate to being a giant, a wizard, or a dwarf. She knew her category, mermaid, and was not about to leave the game and go over and stand against the wall where a loser would stand. She intended to participate wherever mermaids fit into the scheme of things, without giving up dignity or identity. She took it for granted that there was a place for mermaids and that I would, just, that I would know just where. Well, where do the mermaids stand? All the mermaids, all those who are different, who do not fit the norm and who do not accept the available boxes and pigeonholes. Answer that question and you can build a school, a nation, or a world on it. What was my answer at that moment? Well, every once in a while, I say the right thing. The mermaid stands right here by the king of the sea, says I. Yes, right here by the king's fool, I thought to myself. So we stood there, hand in hand, reviewing the troops of wizards and giants and dwarves as they roiled by in wild disarray. It is not true, by the way, that mermaids do not exist. I know at least one personally. I have held her hand. <laughs> and because, unrelatedly, it is almost tax season, I have an offering joke for you. A minister gets a phone call from the IRS asking, is Sam Thompson a member of your congregation? The minister answers, why yes, Sam Thompson is a member of this congregation. The IRS person then asks, did Sam Thompson just make a financial contribution? The minister answers, why yes he did. The IRS person asks, was it for $10,000? The minister catches her breath and responds, it's about to be. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't had a chance to turn in your pledge card, <laughs> now is a great time to do so. Freely we have received, freely may we give. The morning's offering will now be gratefully received.
Steve Sussman's uh, prelude was Palm Leaf Rag. Did, the, did that one have a special title too? <laughs> Never ceases to amaze any of us. Thank you, Steve. Last week in church, I felt like a dog reuniting with its pack. <laughs> After having been away for three months of sabbatical, you're lucky I didn't bowl you all over while leaping about and slobbering a happy reunification dance. I didn't know that I would feel quite like that being back, because it had also felt good to be away for a while. But as I watched you settle into your pews, your faces looked so beautiful to me, each different, each carrying the triumphs and strains of the day. I wondered what I'd missed. I wondered what each of us misses in each other's lives, even when we're around each other a lot. As the service started, I stood beside Olivia Doherty while she lit the chalice, and I remembered an important conversation her mom and I had had before she was even born. There are kids here whom I knew about and longed to meet long before they came into being. Sometimes I've heard about one of your partners for a long while before they come to church, too. I get all excited to meet them, but I try to keep the leaping and slobbering in check. <laughs> it's moments like those that I am reminded that groups work far better because everyone who's there is part of it. The humanists and the theists, the wealthy and the working poor, the pale-skinned folks and the brown-skinned folks, the soldiers and the pacifists, the queer, the gender-queer teens and the elders who've seen it all, dwarfs, giants, mermaids. And at the same time, there was always, always someone missing. At Passover, Jews keep an empty chair at the table to symbolize their hope that the prophet Elijah might join them but it also symbolizes that a stranger or newcomer would be welcome. I looked out at your faces last week and I felt as if you'd pulled a chair out just for me and patted the seat. It made me want to turn and pull one out for the next person who walked in behind me. Hey, welcome to this big old pack of common folks. You're one of us too. Don't worry, I wasn't about to call you all dogs. I want to express my gratitude to all of you for the gift you gave me of a sabbatical and to anyone who picked up work on my behalf while I was away. In year eight, I hate to admit it, but I was getting crotchety. Little things would weigh on me, I'd take things personally, or stay up all night trying to perfect some piece of writing that didn't need that kind of neurotic perfectionism. I had tried to save up my sabbatical for a potential maternity time with a kid but my life hasn't yet lined up quite right for that. And so instead of waiting further, the board and John encouraged me to take some time away to sharpen the saw, so to speak. I'm profoundly grateful to you, and my sense is that the time away gave me much the same experience as the season of Lent gives to many practicing Christians and other folks. Many people find this season of Lent, which shepherds us through the end of winter and into the revival of all things new, a time worthy of reflection. I tried to find a balance of reflection and learning and action. John suggested to me that I might, you all might appreciate knowing how I used the sabbatical time, and I felt embarrassed at first to sort of talk about myself and then I realize that my time is also your time, and so um, I, I will tell you about it. I'll take a moment to do that before we move on to considering Palm Sunday a little more in depth. During January, February, and March, I faced the sense of loss and doom that our election stirred up. I'm not done with that feeling, but I dug deep within to find my own resilience. For me, this meant going to the Women's March in DC, and to an anti-racism conference, a no ban, no wall speak out, a spoken word poetry slam put on by MIPsters, which is Muslim hipsters, and backing my best friend Nazish to start a nonprofit centering on peace activism. In my average day, I think up all sorts of art, and I dream about making brightly colored paintings at night, 
but somehow, uh, what with everything else in my life, I, I seem to just never make that art that I dream about. I really get critical of myself about that because I feel like being an artist is part of who I really am. So I signed up for a stained glass class at Emerson Umbrella in Concord, and I loved every single minute. The lead around the glass smells horrible, but I just loved making stained glass. I know there's people in here who do that for a living, so I've got to talk to you about that. I did not write the children's book I so hoped to write, but I did make a few false starts. Instead, I played guitar and taught myself how to use Audacity, which is an audio editing program, but don't get your hopes up back there in the sound booth. I'm not very good yet. <laughs> Nazish, my friend, and I are sort of aunties to three little girls, and we were able to have them come stay with us for a while while their mom went to visit her fam their, her, their moms and her, her mom left. We're both friends with the mom of these three little girls. The mom went to Pakistan to visit her family. Let's see, they all came and stayed. We stayed up late and ate a lot of sugar and ran around in the woods. <laughs> when the president created the travel ban, we spent a couple scary days with those girls, tucking them in at night and talking with them, wondering if their mom would be allowed back in. Thankfully, she was, but I remain horrified at the bigotry of our current leadership. To capitalize on that outrage, I helped to lead bystander trainings with my playback theater troupe, True Story Theater. With the audience, we practiced scenarios in which we stand up for someone who's being targeted. It's nerve-wracking, sometimes embarrassing, and empowering to do so, to speak up like that. It's not something I did very often as a kid, and sometimes, as Audre Lorde would say, I shake while I try to say what I want to say. At one show at a mosque, Jews and Muslims shared about how it feels to be allies to one another in public because society would more likely expect them to be against one another. Because our troupe performs in over 150 shows a year on many topics that are social justice issues, I had the chance to be in shows about veterans and civilians speaking across the divide a coming-of-age class telling wisdom stories, combating domestic violence, and a night featuring the transgender community. In terms of sharpening my ministry abilities specifically, I listen to tons of sermon podcasts, the good, the bad, and the really ugly. And I read a lot, a lot, a lot. And on Sundays, I fell into the back pews of churches all over the place. I returned to First Parish just in time to cast my vote to become a sanctuary church. And perhaps, like you, I went home on cloud nine thinking that maybe someday soon we'd have someone or maybe even a family join us because we decided to pat the seat beside us and smile our wide welcome. Thank you for the saw-sharpening sabbatical time. I hope to put it all to good use here somehow and I rejoin you with the fresh hope of all that is in bud. The theme of Palm Sunday is radical welcome, and that is our theme today as well. Here is a reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who were following were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. As we are all well aware, the stories surrounding Jesus' last week on earth are legion. The events of the week are recorded in each of the four Gospels, 
and are the subject of God only knows how many movies, books, hymns, songs, and paintings. The time leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus is one of the great dramas of rejection and despair. It has to come before the Easter rejoicing because the promise of a new life and great hope for humanity would be meaningless if there was no understanding of what Jesus' uh, life and then death meant to the people who knew him. You can come and hear more of this story unfold at our annual candlelight tenebrae service on Friday night. Our reading from the Gospel of Mark begins with Jesus, the little understood revolutionary arriving at Jerusalem in order to celebrate the Passover Seder and to confront the rulers and ruling institutions of his day. The entry into Jerusalem is important because the story relates one of the wildest and most politically explosive acts of Jesus' ministry. The story is a reminder of the political challenge of his ministry as well as the revolutionary undertones often embedded in worship itself. As Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, his followers throw their cloaks and their palm fronds down on the ground as a sign of homage and submission, of laying oneself down in hopes that the coming king will be able to bring about deliverance. While the people there are unhappy under Roman rule, they quickly are willing to submit to Jesus who they hope will be their new ruler, a ruler who would bring them freedom and liberation. For all its joyful hosannas, hosanna doesn't mean the same thing as glory to God or any of that. It means uh, save us. Um, for all of its joyful hosannas, Palm Sunday is a day of contrast. We hear it in the happy crowd welcoming their nonviolent activist leader, the same crowd who will, by the end of the week, take part in his crucifixion. We see it in Jesus, the worshipped one, riding in with humility on a borrowed colt, the contrast is clear in the destination of Jerusalem, as the city that welcomes him will later demand his blood. Because we know how the drama of, the, of Holy Week plays out, we can see that the greatest hopes for peace are hidden from those who wish for it. Only on Easter morning will all be revealed. It is not easy to make straight the path for the work of love. Jesus scholars Marcus Borg and John Dominic Croissant give us a riveting image with which to begin. There were actually two processions that Passover week. From the west came Pontius Pilate, draped in the golden glory of imperial power, horses, chariots, and gleaming armor. He moved in with the Roman army at the beginning of Passover week to make sure that nothing got out of hand. Insurrection was in the air with the memory of God's deliverance of the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt. And from the east came another procession, a commoner's parade, Jesus in ordinary robes riding on a young donkey. The careful preparations Jesus made just prior to his arrival suggest that he had planned a highly ritualized, symbolic, prophetic act. The carnivalesque military procession, procession into Jerusalem was a carefully orchestrated piece of guerrilla theater. Riding on the colt, his feet possibly dragging on the ground, Jesus came not as one who lords his authority over others, but as one who humbly rejects domination. His message is of radical acceptance towards each person. He came not as a mighty warrior, but as one who is honorable and refuses to rely on violence. He and his growing band of followers are riling up the poor, the oppressed, the sick, the homeless, telling them that God loves them, telling them that loving each other and being kind to each other is more important than following the old rules. His way was to befriend the outcast, eat meals with the unclean, defend the criminal. The Roman authorities feared him, and their solution was to crush him and others like him, lest their system of domination be upturned. What's interesting is that on Palm Sunday, Jesus takes the role of a jester who acts in a humorous, disorienting way, introducing a totally different understanding of societal rules. It would, never, it would, it would have been sheer mockery of the Roman procession uh, on its own, but add to it the prophecy of Zechariah, of a present, of a, I'm sorry, this sentence got bleh. 
It would have been sheer, a little sabbatical will do that to you. <laughs> it would have been sheer mockery to the Roman procession on its own. But add to it the prophecy of Zechariah of a peasant king riding on a donkey. And we have something that is much more subversive and challenging to Rome's authority than mere theatrics. Jesus' street theater invites us to consider the ways in which lampooning may be a means of unmasking and resisting the powers that be. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem provides the occasion for us to explore the politically subversive nature of scripture through parody and carnival. We know that humor and carnival is a favored method around here. Whether we are goofing around for fun or challenging the powers that be, as one parishioner puts it, what she loves best about First Parish was its circus-like atmosphere. <laughs> I planned that. <laughs> Back in 30 AD, Jesus set up a parody of contrasts. We have our own contradictions in our time, too, of course. Someone tells us the best way to create peace is by initiating a war. Our president's recent decision to launch a missile strike on Syria seems to follow this argument. The strong are strengthened by holding off the weak. Parents confront fear by storing a handgun in the dresser drawer. Schools encourage competition over cooperation. Governments and businesses seek to win at all costs, even if it bankrupts them. Jesus rides his lowly farm animal through all of it. This is the normalcy of civilization, Bible scholar Borg and Crisan remind us. It is important to realize that what killed Jesus was nothing unusual. As empires go, Rome was better than most. There was nothing exceptional or abnormal about it. This is simply the way domination systems behave. We live today in a society where greed, hate, and closed-mindedness look so normal that sometimes we don't even notice it until we do. In our own lives and communities, what are the things that make for peace? What are the things hidden from our eyes? As Unitarian Universalists, we stand firmly against the Roman Empire of our day. Becoming a sanctuary church will most likely not be without difficulties. Will we have the support of our neighbors in town? Will we be able to create a safe enough place Will there be barriers of language, race, or class? Will we be able to welcome our guests as equals into our church life, or will we find ourselves pitying them in some way? Will our government put pressure on us in a way that we are not equipped to handle? Will we have enough financial backing to see this through? Will we continue to stand together as a community to support this one small act of defiance as our own form of subversive guerrilla theater? Despite the supposed separation of church and state, we are about to play our own game of chess. Make no doubt that we are confronting politics on behalf of justice, just as people of faith have always done. History is replete with the stories of common folk who have recognized that we are able to accomplish more together than we can alone. Stories that we might well do to remember as we continue our Lenten journey. They include the women and men who provided safe passage on the Underground Railroad for people seeking freedom from chattel slavery in the United States in the mid-19th century. Remember also Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others in the Confessing Church in the 1930s who took a definitive stance that their loyalty was to God, not to Hitler and the Nazis. Youth in South Africa stood against apartheid and formed the African National Congress Youth League in 1944 under the leadership of Nelson Mandela, envisioning a world in which racial domination would no longer exist. Many others joined these exemplars of uncommon courage, including the 250,000 women, men, and children from diverse racial, ethnic, social, and religious backgrounds who gathered in the US Capitol on August 28, 1963, anchored in an abiding faith in respect and human dignity. And let the half a million people, or maybe more, who attended the Women's March this year not go unmentioned as well. 
Our values guide us in the ways of truth and love, whether our beliefs are the same or not. We seek to help one another with our words and deeds and to not hold back when we might act. We lift up the human journey, not for what is glorified in our society, status and power, wealth and political leverage, but rather for the courage it takes to live a life of integrity, interdependence, and goodwill. William G. Carter writes, years ago I was studying the New Testament while my father worked for a military contractor. That prompted many interesting conversations during my school vacations. I spoke to him about my dreams for world peace and he listened patiently. Sometimes he noted that it was people like him who put money in the offering plate so that people like me could become pastors. After one of my rants, he said, I do not disagree with anything you have said, but we will never have peace on earth until we can quiet the wars within our own hearts. Then he looked at me as if to say, they should teach you such things at the seminary. I'd like to close with a poem written recently by a young black female social activist, Mickey Scott Bay Jones. It captures how we must try to be with one another in the spirit of our radical welcome. It asks us to remember what are the things that make for truth, respect, and solidarity. It invites us to have our eyes open to the pain of the world while embodying peace within. If our church is to be a sanctuary for those society would cast out, we need to grab hold of the Palm Sunday extravagance. Waving our palm fronds, we pat the seat beside us. Let us welcome every being among us as if they are the long-awaited peasant king on horseback or a new beloved child we can't wait to know or at least a member of a good old pack of common folks. This is Mickey Scott Bay Jones's poem, An Invitation to Brave Space. Together we will create brave space because there is no such thing as safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we have all caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our brave space together, and we will work in it side by side. May it be so. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 128, For All That Is Our Life.
Our closing words are by Carl Seberg. Between the dawn and dusk of our being, let us be brave and loving. In our little passage through the light, let us sustain and forward the human venture in gentleness, in service, and in thought. May it be so. Go in peace, gentle people. <laughs>